So this is a good example of a scholarly article. And I just want to walk you through a couple of the elements um, that you often find in scholarly articles. You won't find every single one all the time, but if you kind of remember the pieces that make up what a scholarly article is, uh, it's, it should be a little bit easier to recognize it, you know, when you see one. So often um, you'll see right here, it says research article. So that's an indicator that it's a scholarly or peer reviewed article. You'll also see in scholarly articles, the list of authors. Um, they often have multiple authors, but when it lists authors, it'll have these numbers by their name. And down here, it'll tell you um, at the corresponding number, the author's affiliation. So typically this is where they work or they study. It's usually an institution of higher education or an institute that studies something um, it's typically not, you know, a journalist who works for an organization or somebody who's writing for a for-profit institution. It's typically colleges and universities. Okay, so if we keep scrolling down, you'll see the abstract. This is often what you find in a scholarly article. It's just kind of a summary of what the article is. So you can read it before you decide if you want to download the whole thing. Also, scholarly and peer-reviewed articles often have to be funded, especially in the sciences. So the authors who are doing original research, and that's the big thing about scholarly articles is that it's often, um, you know, 90% of the time the author or authors are writing about original research that they've conducted themselves. And you need money to be able to do that kind of research. And so they have to get funding from grants and other organizations and agencies. And they'll often tell you in the article where that money came from. So if we keep scrolling down, um, like I said, you'll often see original research and they'll publish it, their results in the article. So if you're seeing things like graphs and charts and summaries of research, that's a pretty good indicator that you're looking at something that's scholarly. Okay, and then if we go all the way down to the bottom, you'll notice also that this article is quite lengthy. Um, scholarly and peer-reviewed articles tend to be a little bit longer than something you'd get in a newspaper or magazine. But if we go all the way to the bottom, you'll have this list of references. So even though this is a piece of original research, the authors looked at other research that have been done in the field as a way to compare their results. And they listed everything they looked at and used when they were putting their study together here. So that's another good indicator. If we go back um, to the detailed record, there's a few little tricks you can use in the database. So when you click on an article from your results list, you'll get routed to this page and it'll just kind of give you an overview of what the article is about. If we scroll down, um, we get those author affiliations again in the abstract. We get the document type where it'll say article. And then what's important here is where it says source and this says close one. So if you click on that, It'll give you a little bit of information about what that source is. And it says in the description that Close One reports on primary research from any scientific discipline. So that means that it's a scholarly publication. And it'll tell you right here that it's an academic journal, which is just another way of saying scholarly. So there's lots of indicators when something is scholarly and peer reviewed. So recognizing a popular source or popular article is probably the simplest of the three scholarly, popular, and trade, um, because it's what we look at the most. So most of the things we read online, or even when we're doing research in a database, there's popular sources in there too. Um, but most of what we look at on a day-to-day -day basis is considered a popular source. And so you're probably gonna be really fast at recognizing these when you see them, but we're still gonna go over some of the big indicators of a source that's popular. So right off the bat, you can see that this article looks quite different than the one we just looked at, right? It's got a ton of color. It's using graphics, um, different types of font. It lists a website. So popsci.com, this is an article published in Popular Science and probably also on their website. You typically don't see that in scholarly or trade publications. If we were to read through this a little bit, and compare the language used in an article like this to a 
language used in a scholarly article, we would see that it was quite different. This language is probably more casual. It doesn't use terms that the everyday reader wouldn't recognize, whereas a scholarly article is going to use jargon or terms associated with that discipline. So if it's a, you know, a biology article, you're probably going to see a lot of biology terms or something, you know, like that. Whereas this is going to be written for your everyday regular reader. You get the authors, but you don't get any information about them. Um, you could Google them and you'd see that they worked for Popular Science Magazine. And then, like I said earlier, there's all kinds of graphics, right? So the article itself is actually pretty short. Um, the information is presented to you in kind of these one or two little paragraph things, so it's really easy to read and digest. All right, so now let's talk about what a trade article looks like. I think trade articles are sometimes the hardest to identify because they kind of um, exist in the space between scholarly articles and popular articles, and it takes more of a, you know, a judgment call when you're looking at a trade article to identify what it is. But this is a good example of a trade article. So if you remember from the Evaluating Sources tutorial that you just did, or that you're kind of in the middle of doing, um, trade articles are articles that are written by professionals in any field for other professionals in that field. So the people who read trade articles are professionals who want to stay up to date on things that are happening in their field. So this is one um, written by and for librarians. And you can sort of tell from the title that it's probably not scholarly, right? Top skills for tomorrow's librarians doesn't sound like real heavy duty research. Um, and then it gives you a little, it's not an abstract like the one we just saw, but it gives you a little summary of what you're about to read. Okay, you can see as you scroll through it that it's a little bit more visually appealing than scholarly articles tend to be. There's more color, sometimes there's photographs, um, but you're not going to see the charts and graphs that you would see with scholarly. And then if we keep going down, it will tell you a little bit of information here about the, uh, the author. So Meredith Schwartz is an executive editor at LJ, which stands for Library Journal. So she may be a librarian. Um, or she may just have be a professional that's worked in the library field for a really long time, which also makes her a bit of an authority. Uh, if we keep going, though, you'll see a better example. The second article by Jennifer A. Dixon. If we scroll down here, we see that she is actually a librarian. She's a graduate student at the School of Information at the Pratt Institute in New York. So she's not quite a librarian yet, but she's getting there. So... Um, She's written an article for the people in her field, someone like me, to read if I was just graduating and I wanted to know what the top skills were, or if I wanted to kind of stay up to date, I might read something like this. So when you're looking at trade articles, try to determine who the audience for the article might be, and that will take you a long way in figuring out whether or not you're looking at a trade article or something else.